time, please join me in welcoming to the stage Vice Admiral Peter Daly, U.S. Navy retired, publisher and chief executive officer of the U.S. Naval Institute. Okay, good morning. The first propaganda announcement's been made about sunny San Diego. That was good. We had a terrific day yesterday, uh, high energy, and our keynotes challenged us to engage actively on the conference theme, the need to sharpen our competitive edge, carried through in the keynotes, the panel sessions, and the floor engagement theaters. And I also thought there was a strong sense of urgency to get on with several things. So that set us up well for today. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce our morning keynote speaker, the Honorable Alan Schaefer, Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment. From 2015 to 2018, Mr. Schaefer served as the Director of the NATO Collaboration Support Office. And prior to his time at NATO, he was the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for research and engineering from 2007 to 2015, serving twice during that time frame as acting assistant secretary. Before entering the federal government, Mr. Schaefer served a 24-year career in the United States Air Force in command, weather, intelligence, and acquisition oversight. Mr. Schaefer has earned multiple bachelor's and master's of science degrees. He was awarded the meritorious Executive Presidential Rank Award in 2014, the Department of Defense Distinguished Civilian Service Award, and the Distinguished Executive Presidential Rank Award in 2007 and 2015. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Secretary Alan Schaefer. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you. I, I always wonder who they're talking about when I hear the bio, because it sure doesn't sound like me. Uh, good morning, everybody. How's it going? Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of comments, then I have some slides. Um, you heard a couple themes yesterday. You know, return to uh, great power competition. I very much like the, uh, the CNO's challenge to us to talk about the conference in terms of how do we improve the ability to defer, deter, defeat, and win. But as I was out here this morning talking to some of the people, uh, I have another kind of sub-theme that I'd like to leave with you. So I represent now uh, acquisition and sustainment, the people who buy things too slowly and fix things too slowly. And the whole point of an, a reorganization about a year ago was to make things come out to the field, to the fleet, to the soldiers, to the, to the airmen, to the Marines, more, more quickly. So I'd like you to think about how do we set the new normal for delivery of operational capability to the people who are sending out into very dangerous places. And I kind of like that, the new normal. I don't want to be part of a system that takes 20 years to deliver a, a capability. I want to get there faster. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I also would like to echo some of the Admiral's comments uh, one of the real advantages of this type of event is getting out and networking, meeting people. And it, it seemed pretty sedate until I was walking in this morning and I heard a couple of guys talking about going out last night, smoking a couple of stogies and drinking bourbon and swapping stories. That's part of this too. And that made me realize I was at a largely Navy event. So let's go to the first slide. Typically, I hate these types of things where someone comes in with a mission statement. But I think it's important here, and it, those are all the words that are written. Uh, how many of you remember the old Undersecretary for Acquisition Technology and Logistics? Okay, so about 10% of you. I gotta tell you, you guys don't come to Washington enough. Uh, and, and I'm envious of that. So we had this old office that was responsible for everything from inception of idea to fielding. Uh, about two years ago, Congress split up the offices into one that I'm in right now, 
acquisition and sustainment, how do we buy things better, how do we improve the operational throughput and, and maintenance of stuff, uh, and they formed the research and engineering office. But there was another major change. Most programs now have been delegated to the services to deliver more quickly because the idea is the services have the fire in their belly to get things out, except for things like joint systems and that thing. So when I take all the words that are at the top of this with the mission statement, I think of it this way. My job is to do everything I can to field the best operational capability to the kids we employ and do it for a good value for the taxpayer. And if we do that, we'll, we will do a much better job of reaching Admiral uh, Richardson's goal of deter, defeat, and win. Now, I'm going to start with a little bit of high-level stuff because how many of you have been in Washington, been stationed in Washington? Oh, good. You have more people been stationed in Washington and heard of the offices. That's actually pretty good news. Um, we actually have, I think, a really cogent national defense strategy. It was put out by uh, Secretary Mattis. And in his first press conference, Acting Secretary uh, Pat Shanahan was very clear. No changes to the priorities, no change to the strategy. It's really, you know, go faster on the implementation and execution of this. And the strategy is built really on three pillars, all of which are critical. Build a more lethal and ready force, strengthen alliances and attract new partners, and reform the department for greater performance and, and uh, affordability. So I like to make these interactive. Anybody out there feel good with the respect to the U.S.'s strategic position with regard to potential near-peer adversaries? Anybody uncomfortable? Anybody awake? I'm just trying to make this a little bit more interactive. The, the first part is really critical. We have spent 18 years equipping and fighting a counterinsurgency type fight. And as we've done that, Potential other nations have really paid attention to the high-end capabilities that the U.S. had and have figured out how to minimize the, the effect of those capabilities. So I look at this audience, a uh, naval audience. I'm not sure I'd want to be a surface warfare officer right now sailing in the, the, uh, the Westpac because China's done some really remarkable things in fielding capabilities that will make us stop and pause. We'll still go fight, and if we had to fight against China, I think we would win pretty decisively, but it would not be an easy fight. So we have to think about that. So why speed and delivery? Why are we focused on speed and delivery? Because we have to. One of the things I did in my previous tour in the Pentagon uh, was help field the, uh, the mine-resistant ambush protection vehicles. Uh, I was the executive director of the task force and got to report to Secretary Gates once a week for an hour at a time. That's not an, that wasn't a pleasant experience. But we fielded 28,000 vehicles in four years. We can, buy, we can buy things fast. We can field them fast. It just takes some incredible focus and it takes the operator and the acquisition folks and the technicians to come together and decide what you need and what you don't need. So although I don't have it in here, for this particular community and the people I'm talking to here now, always challenge requirements. You want to have a small set of requirements to build things from. So uh, how many, how many folks get the sense that we have too many requirements for the things that we're buying, and, uh, buying for our kids? Okay, about 10, 15 percent, to include the admiral who was responsible for those for a number of years. Um, I look at the requirements documents coming out, and we're over -prescribe, we, we were over-prescribing -pre systems. We're trying to get to a more rational set of requirements. But I want to leave you with a story. And if you think of nothing else coming out of this, um, it's an old story now. How many folks bought an iPod in the old days? The, the millennials won't know what an iPod is. Apple was going out of business. 
and they needed a new product. Steve Jobs called his engineers in and said, I want you to build a device that holds 10,000 songs, can retrieve a song in five seconds, and has one button. That was the requirement set for the iPod that gave Apple the cash flow to move into all the things that we have now. That's how you set requirements. It's based on needs, and then let the engineers talk with the folks who are going to use it and deliver what has to be delivered at the right time. So why is this important? You hear a lot in the press lately uh, about China. An unclassified report put out in January this year by DIA, and I'm just summarizing it a little bit, was really very good. If this is the unclassified report, you can imagine what would be behind the covers. But the DIA report, January this year, the People's Liberation Army has about 300 million active duty and reserve forces and 20, 200 billion a year in funding. Doesn't sound like as much as in the US, but it's hard to compare dollars. What's important is they have been increasing their funding for military systems dramatically over the last decade. And now they have the largest navy in the region, in the, in the Westpac region, with more than 300 ships. But they also have launched an aircraft carrier. It's nowhere near as good as the aircraft carriers in the US, but it gives them force projection power. They do have a nuclear triad. And most notably, they have fielded operationally their first fifth generation fighter. Chinese systems are not as good as US systems yet, but the gap is closing very, very rapidly. Part of the, the Chinese doctrine is having an active missile force. Any Navy people worry about the Chinese missile force? OK, maybe 10 people. Really? Really? So if you, you can go to The Economist and get this. The China has operationally fielded medium-range uh, medium ballistic missiles that can range out as far as Guam. And there's a doctrine, and they have enough in their inventory, so they're not going to come at you one at a time. So if you're in a surface fleet, a surface ship, and you have to deal with an incoming salvo of 8, 10, 12 missiles, you, you going to be comfortable? I would not be. That's a daunting challenge. And that will, that will affect how we think about the fight. And that will affect uh, where we're going in the future. And we have to develop counters to that so we can continue to provide freedom of navigation. And this is about more than just military. This is about economic. If you remember, Admiral Richardson yesterday talked about elements of diplomacy, elements of military power, and elements of economic power. I look at the US naval forces as the first bastion, the first line of defense for US, economic, US and allied economic strength in the world. If you don't have freedom of navigation, things change. So I think that the understanding where China is going with their missile force is incredibly important. The other thing that we have to worry about with China, and with, to some extent, Russia and other nations, is technological advancement. The Chinese have targeted certain technologies to insert them into operational capability. And it's important. Now, I was not here yesterday, but I understand, understand that uh, Under Secretary Modley was talking about uh, artificial intelligence or almost implementable. I share with his, his opinion of the phrase artificial intelligence. Anybody, anybody love artificial intelligence? OK, a couple, that's good. Keep loving it, but make it understandable, OK? What's important about artificial intelligence is turning the information into a decision. How do you get to a decision space more quickly? So when in doubt, I love The Economist. I hope you can see that in the back. The Economist had an article about a year ago, does China play fair? 
They have gone into areas of intellectual property borrowing or theft. They've gone into cyber effects in a very large way. They're using economic pressure on the rest of the Westpac region. And their ethical basis is different than, than what ours is. Just a different frame of reference. But this is what we're looking at and this is what we're facing. And why does it matter? Okay. I also stole this from The Economist, the, the cartoon. And this was about, uh, just about a year ago, where the, the title of the, the Economist that week was The Coming Digital Battlefield. Okay, so my job is to field, or help field, planes, armored vehicles, ships, but also the enablers. Without those enablers, we will not be nearly as effective in fighting. And one of the biggest enablers is digital supremacy. Who can turn knowledge into decisions most quickly? So I say frequently, and it's my first bullet up here, a hundred years ago, wars were won by the folks with the biggest biceps. That's not the future. The future is who can get to the right decision most quickly? And what enables decisions? Turning a lot of data over to algorithms to crunch it to help give a decision. What most people call artificial intelligence. Uh, it's not a panacea. It's not perfect. It's not everything. But the concept of turning data into a uh, the right decision more quickly, or more importantly, pointing out when something is going south, is incredibly important. So artificial intelligence, what most people call that, will help speed decisions. It improves with more data, and it will give an economic leverage. So remember, we're talking about a strong military to preserve economic freedom of movement. Artificial intelligence will give someone an advantage in the economic area. Lots and lots of limitations. Most notably, I haven't found a system yet that thinks as well as a human. And I think it will be a very long time until we, we get there. I also think that the things that drive a lot of the artificial intelligence um, development, the economic, the commercial aspects, are not what drive the U.S. military. What drives us is being able to win or deter uh, and then win in a combat. Go back to, to Admiral Richard, Richardson's comments. But I want to talk about this for just a minute because we are not the only nation working for digital su supremacy. from the 13th five-year plan, and can you see that in the back? Yeah. Okay, good. The quote on the bottom, I think, is incredibly powerful and tells you where China, one of the rise of the great competitors, is going. It'll advance an ambitious multi-billion dollar national agenda, uh, China will, to achieve predominance in its critical technology domain. China's going all in on the digital environment. They're going all in on turning data into decisions. It's kind of a big deal. It is to me, because these are the things that will enable the platforms that we're buying. But it's not just China. And <clears throat> don't care what you think about him, but Mr. Putin can really sometimes just take the wonderful words of the Chinese and get it right down to the, the bedrock. Putin said, whoever becomes the leader in the sphere of artificial intelligence will become ruler of the world. Might be a little bit of a hyperbole, don't know. But these, these are the people who we have to think about as potential near-peer competitors in both the military the economic and the political realms. And then we've got to take these new technologies and put them into actionable systems that we're fielding for our young men and women. Now, 
I'm going to go through a few more things before I get into what my boss's priorities are. And I'm going to do this for a reason. Uh, by 2026, I want to hear if there's any guesses. What's going to be the largest part, largest discretionary part of the U.S. budget if things don't change? Anybody know? Debt? I heard debt. Servicing the debt. Isn't that a lovely term, servicing the debt? That means paying interest. That means the largest discretionary part of the budget by 2026, before we get any product, is paying interest. There's going to be some tough choices up ahead. So we're looking at the conventional force. How do we increase the number of ships in the Navy? How do we increase the number of airplanes and squadrons in the Air Force? How do we increase and, and modernize naval and, and naval, marine, and air force maritime? At the same time, we're implementing a missile defense review. Came out in, again, about January. And if, if you haven't read it, it's a pretty remarkable document. But I'll give you the banner, the banner at the bottom. The goal from the, the White House and the administration uh, can be summed up as defeat any missile, anytime, anywhere. That's a pretty daunting task. Anybody think it's going to be done cheaply? It's not going to be done cheaply. And yet this is one of the primary pillars of our national security strategy. At the same time, last year we published a nuclear posture review. And the, uh, the bars at the bottom show the total investment in the nuclear triad as a percent of, got to make sure I get this, percent of defense budget. So back when we were first putting in the triad, back from just following the uh, Second World War, quite a bit of the national budget, or not the defense budget, went to creating the nuclear triad. But we've lived through a period of 15 years where the nuclear triad has only cost about 25 to 3% of the defense budget. With the modernization of the Air Force's next generation bomber, with the Columbia class, with the, the, gen the next generation of um, surface-based missiles, we're projected to go up to somewhere between 6 and 7% by the end of the next decade. So now do you see why we have to have urgency and acquisition and what we're buying and efficiency and get there? Remember, you put these things together. Biggest discretionary part of the budget, service the debt. We're going to have enormous pressure on reducing the debt, which means that defense spending, I'd like to tell you it's going to keep going up. I'm not terribly optimistic. We're implementing a whole raft of new systems. We're growing our force. We heard Admiral Bill Lusher yesterday talk about the analytic basis of the Navy budget. Absolutely critical. We've got to figure out where we get our best bang, bang for the buck. So we're modernizing the force. We're growing the force. We're implementing the Missile Defense Review. And we're just about to start chunking into big dollars in the Nuclear Posture Review. Um, at one point in my career, I was a programmer. That's Pentagon speak for people who put together budgets. Uh, I'm kind of glad I don't have to do that in the next decade. This is a really daunting problem. So why does that matter to you? It means there's going to be, A, competition for ideas. It means we have to develop the new normal. And thank you for giving me the line today. We have to develop the new normal in acquisition to make sure that what we buy we field quickly and not necessarily 100 percent, but things that are effective. You know, one of the things that really drives up cost in acquisition programs is time. Time is money. If we can start to reduce the cycle time on what we're delivering, we'll do a little bit better. So I want to close by giving you 
the more detailed priorities of my boss. So I work for Ellen Lord, who is the Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment. I'm her deputy. And she published a number of priorities uh, earlier this year. So remember, I said we, we've changed the way we're doing business. We're letting the services decide milestone decisions for acquisition programs in the service domain. Great idea. Her job, my job, is to figure out how do we get capability out more quickly with a lot less, and I, I will use the phrase wasted money, and I don't want that to sound pejorative because no one wakes up in the morning saying, how can I waste government money today? But we've got to figure out how to identify very quickly when programs are, are going off the rails and we've got to be willing to kill programs rather than spend a lot of money if something's going to be beyond our, our, our capacity. So that's why you heard yesterday uh, with the Undersecretary, and you'll hear from Hondo Gertz, the whole concept of prototype, prototype to buy down risk, prototype when it's cheaper, and figure out what you're going to buy. And then when you actually go into acquisition, reducing the cycle time. Now, who's critical in that process? I heard program managers, operators, subject matter experts, okay. So you know what I'm hearing? To go faster, to field the right thing, it's a contact sport. We're not playing baseball here, we're going out full contact. And it's gotta be full contact with the operators, people who've been out, who are gonna use this stuff, with the, the, the wild-eyed scientists who come up with the ideas, with the engineers who figure out what's in the realm of the possible. And we gotta do that together. And as painful as it is, for each of those communities, I need operators who can go talk to technical people, and I need technical people and engineers who can go talk to operators. And we all gotta give a little. We all gotta find compromise because at the end of the day, it's what are we fielding, what capabilities are we fielding for the people in the field at the lowest possible price. I heard Bill Lesher up here yesterday talk, Admiral Lesher, about putting together the budget and having some of the arguments they had where someone came in and said, I need 100% of my requirement. I only have 95% now. And the question coming back is, what's that last 5% doing a fight? We've got to be able to answer those questions, and they're hard questions to answer. So I'm going to go through uh, Ms. Lord's priorities quickly, because I really would like to open this up to questions. Um, I should have started before I go into her priorities. I'm just kind of curious. How many people out here are taxpayers? OK, I got about five people who didn't raise their hands, so we got the IRS in the back. Um, we're all taxpayers. What should matter to you as a taxpayer in national security? Getting the best capability we can for our young people who are going to deploy into very bad places for the best possible dollar. And folks, that's a contact sport. So very quickly through uh, Ms. Lord's priorities, uh, significantly improve the F-35 program execution. I will tell you that she spends roughly 25% of her time on JSF. Uh, we're having some success in driving down the projected sustainment costs, but this is an expensive, expensive airplane. And it's gonna take, remember I talked about the different parts of modernization and nuclear defense, uh, nuclear posture review and missile defense review. Conventional source, the amount of money we are spending on the JSF dwarfs almost all other programs in the Defense Department. If we can knock 10 or 20 percent of the cost out of that, we'll have a lot of additional money left to help pay off the national debt and deliver more capability. Second priority, drive the nuclear enterprise reforms to keep modernization on track. So we're just now gearing up. We're taking a really hard look 
at how realistic are the costs and schedules for the B-21 Avenger, for the Columbia class, for all of the follow-on parts of the nuclear missile, or the nuclear deterrent. And that's a hard job. We also have to remain responsive to co combatant commanders' needs now. Probably the highest priority is the day-to-day -day fight and making sure the people we have deployed downrange have the gear that they need. Uh, the second one, the Used Warfighter Senior Integration Group, is really a bureaucracy. But it's a group that's been brought together, was brought together about six years ago, comprised and co-chaired by the Joint Chiefs of Staff, J3, and the Undersecretary for ANS, with the Comptroller in the room, with the requirements folks in the room. It's really a model of how do you decide what you're going to buy, get there very quickly as a contact sport. Okay. I was talking to some people over here earlier, and the Undersecretary yesterday talked about uh, the number of manufacturers for certain components and turbine engines. I think it was the cowling or the, the case, and we're down to one. Last year, uh, maybe about October, our office put out an open report uh, responding to the President's Executive Order 13806. You can tell that these are done up for a Washington audience. So 13806 directed the Department to look at the whole industrial base and determine where we might have critical shortfalls. Critical shortfalls are where you have either one or maybe two suppliers of something that's absolutely vital. We have over 120 different instances where we have critical shortfalls in the industrial base. Congress has responded. They've given us more money for things like Defense Production Act, Title III. But we now have an implementation team going through and trying to figure out what are the most important industries to the U.S. to keep alive, to look to offshore with trusted, trusted uh, partners. But folks, we don't want to be relying on supplies, on materials from nations that we can't trust. And we're getting there very quickly. So help us. And in the industrial base, if you have a supply, uh, supply shortfall, if you have a supply thread that isn't working particularly well, you've got to let people know. We have got to ensure that we maintain the, uh, the industrial base. Uh, Accelerate efforts to deliver integrated chem, bio, radiological, and nuclear early warning to tactical commanders. Um, I haven't said much about the nuclear bio biological threat now, but that is a growing threat in the world, and we've got to pay attention to it. And then Ms. Lord also wants to support building partnership capacities in CENTCOM primarily and using foreign, uh, foreign military sales to reinforce joint and international lethality. Okay, uh, we've already talked about the nuclear enterprise and driving down the risk. Um, we want to create and sustain resilient installations our warfighters can depend upon in peace and after an attack or natural disaster. So that's Washington speak for, I talked about the missiles from China. If we have to deploy forces west, is it easier or harder if we have access to Guam? You want to have Guam there? Yeah. yeah. Could we lose some of the, the capabilities that are currently in Guam? Yeah. Yes. So you start putting all this together. If we have to defend our economic uh, freedom of motion and we have to go to the Westpac to fight, it becomes a much harder problem if we don't have the logistics basis forward to be able to uh, provide capability. Okay, I'll go through these next couple quickly because I want to save time for questions. Uh, strength and alliances. Uh, the first one is very specific. The United Kingdom has a very good chemical biological uh, weapons program. We want to look for the trusted allies and rely on those and not rebuild the capability here in the U.S. 
We're looking for more partners, uh, especially in a couple parts of the world. We're looking to shape country engagement as part of the theater campaign plans through industrial engagement. And we're looking for new security provisions in international cooperative arrangements. So that's a nice way of saying we want to make sure we're, we are protecting the important parts of U.S. systems, even in international arrangements, we're protecting them safely and securely. Uh, the third part of the National Defense Strategy was reform the department. That's really about finding things that we are doing now that we may not have to do in the future to free up money to go to combat capability. You've heard a lot about in the past tooth to tail ratio. Well, we're still looking to cut the tail and increase the tooth. So you can read these. Um, probably not much for folks in this audience. This one there is. Uh, implementing Executive Order 13806. This really is a, an effort between industry and the government to make sure that our critical supply chains are secure and we can get the material we need to field systems. Um, haven't talked much about it. The second bullet, field of multi-tier supply chain visibility capability. We've got to know that when we buy things that we have security built in. So there's been a lot about some nations stealing intellectual property. There's been a lot about some nations putting in listening devices into things like handsets for 5G systems. Uh, I think it was in the New York Times that the New York Times called out Huawei. We've got to make sure that what, we, what we're buying as commercial systems to integrate into a full capability, combat capability, have parts that we can rely on and we know what they're, they're coming from. So with that, and looking at the clock, it's about right, I'd like to go ahead and stop. Uh, I don't have my, my get off the stage uh, slide, but if you leave or get nothing else from me, it's we have a challenge Money's going to be hard. We have to work much closer together to field systems that provide capability to our young kids that will make a difference. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. And hopefully there's some questions. Otherwise, we'll have the IRS come in here. Questions? Anything, anybody? Good morning, sir. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you for your comments and remarks, and I, I really appreciate what you came to say today. Your first slide had uh, a statement that said, best possible operational capability for the taxpayer. Yep. And um, I wanted to ask you, we've heard a lot of speakers talk about agile development. Yep. We've heard a lot of people talk about the culture in which we live in, and you've probably heard these questions before, but one of the things that I, I keep thinking keeps us from moving faster is the word best possible. And that agile mm. is, is a, a more of a risk, uh, a risk aversion, but risk acceptance thing. So how do we change the culture that gives us the ability to go to best operational capability yeah. for the taxpayer, leaving out the word possible? So it's a great question. I actually would turn it. What we've been doing for the last quarter century is attempting to field the best operational capability. And we've been spending a lot of time and money to go from 90% to 100%. The concept and the, the use of the word best possible, and that implies in a, in a timely matter, uh, best possible is you get it to where it provides a really good capability for our, our troops and you spin it out. Now, all of these initiatives we have ongoing, uh, agile acquisition, great words. What it means is you got five years to demonstrate a capability. That's pretty powerful because you can buy down risk. When we look at the use of other transactions for development, not for buying um, uh, an, 
a final end system. But when you look at using things like other transactions that allows you to get on contract faster and actually demonstrate something, then you buy down the risk. Then you decide what is the best possible capability I can field. Not the best, but the best possible. And then you have people who have, hopefully have some knowledge, do some trades. Do I have to have this last 10%? Will the 90% be good enough to give me capability? And most of the time, the 90% is pretty damn good. And if I can get to the 90% in four years, as opposed to the 100% in 10 years, I'm going to save a lot of money. Time is money. I'm going to get capability in the hands of the person who's going to use it. And then we can always enhance it and improve it. I mean, there's, there's under underlying things we haven't talked about. Using open systems, modular open systems architectures for subcomponents, that will allow us to field what we can now and then upgrade as technology progresses. So I'm actually, you and I were at the same place. We we're just using a different form of English. That's OK. <laughs> the whole concept is do what you can do now, get it out, let people use it, and then improve on it. And is that what you're asking for? Yes, sir. We're Thank on the you. same team. Hi, good morning, sir. Megan Eckstein with USNI News. Um, I wanted to ask you about the sustainment side of your job. Yep. Um, yep. Across the services, maintenance depots and Navy public shipyards are facing backlogs of work. They're facing uh, other challenges that are causing um, effects on military readiness. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know kind of how you're looking at that whole enterprise for efficiencies as well as maybe changes for day-to-day -day maintenance at the ship level or at a squadron level that could perhaps reduce the workload on those depots and shipyards. So I'd like to tell you we have a coherent plan. I think uh, Assistant Secretary uh, McMahon, whose job is sustainment, does have a very good plan. I'm not going to make up elements here. What I know is that Bob and I have talked. We know that somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of all system costs are in sustainment. Um, he's going out and looking at how various industries think about sustainment. Things like using very large data sets with algorithms to do maintenance when you need it. Um, but we still have to get after some of the, the, um, uh, the challenges of legacy systems. So when we keep systems operating for 20 years, the electronic components that we have inside are based on chips that you can't buy anymore. So it's a very complex issue. I wish I had a good answer for you. What I'd say instead is that um, you know, if you have a chance and if you come to Washington, sit down with uh, Assistant Secretary McMahon. And he's got some really good ideas and good people working for him. But again, the best ideas aren't going to come out of, uh, out of the Pentagon necessarily. They're going to come out with the kids in the field who are maintaining the equipment. They're going to come out of the depots. And then we have to look at how do we think about where can we, where can we reduce cost? And I'll tell you, we're looking at it. We're thinking about it. I don't have an answer for you. Thank you. You bet. Stephen Cox, Spay War System Center. Uh, I am a chief engineer in the depot. So bottom line up front, I'm going to ask you, what is the best way to kill a requirement? I'll give you, a, I'll give you an example. We have legacy systems that are costing us five figures to maintain when a COT system costs three figures to mm -hmm. replace. We've got all the players in the room. Everyone looked at the problem and said, yes, but what can we do? You can't find the, the right combination of people, get the right agreement to remove a requirement. What is your advice? <laughs> um, so I will give you the first, your first question, your first sentence was really good. What's the best way to kill a requirement? Um, leadership courage. It sounds silly, um, but until you have leaders who are willing to say, this makes no sense, we're going to continue doing things that will leave you scratching your head. Um, having said that, whomever makes a decision to go a different way has to be willing to, to, 
<clears throat> strap on uh, body armor to his or her body and go into the Capitol and tell our 530 some odd uh, member board of directors called Congress why we're changing something and why it might take business out of their district. Um, it's complex. And at the end of the day, it all comes down to courage. Do we have the courage necessary to save money and do the right thing? <clears throat> and if we have leaders who don't, we're going to continue to flail. Um, I, I was in Paris for three years. I came back. Uh, I noticed a change in temperament uh, across the Pentagon. Uh, it's amazing what a near-peer near adversary will do. Um, from your position, you have to just be willing to continue to say, this is what we need to do, this is why it makes sense. But don't give me the argument in terms of technology. Give me the argument in terms of money that can be saved or capability that can be enhanced. And, and all discussion should be really framed around reduction in cost, increase in capability. And then if people still don't pull the trigger, then we got a bigger problem. So help us frame the argument in terms that will help us make a better business decision. Because you're talking about business decisions. Did that answer your question? Or is it Washington bureau, bureau, bureaucratic? No, sir. I know what I have to do now. I will. Thank you. You bet. Sir, Justin, uh, Justin Katz inside defense. Uh, so you said that you're not terribly optimistic about the idea that the defense budget is going to grow in, uh, in future years. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess uh, I wanted to ask you to go one step further on that, which is, you know, what does that mean for the Pentagon, for DOD? Because uh, as I'm sure you're aware, there's no shortage of studies, analysis, punditry, yep. yada, 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 that's yep. saying defense needs more money. Mm -hmm. um, so I will answer your question two ways. This will prove I'm from Washington. I believe defense needs more money to do what we're being asked to do. Um, short of that, it will take, and again, this was Admiral Lesher pointed out very nicely yesterday, it will take a much stronger effort in analyzing the impact of the various systems. And the ones we pursue most rapidly are those that will provide the biggest Big, biggest capability enhancement. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, Defense Department's no different than uh, um, coaching a basketball team, okay? If I'm coaching a basketball team, my, my objective is to get the best performance out of the people I have. That's what we want to do in the Department of Defense. I, I may not be able to change the people I have. I may not be able to change the budget but I can work very hard on getting the best aggregate across the board capability for the amount of money we have. I'm going to continue to advocate for more budget. I'm not terribly optimistic I'll get it. So that means we have to be looking at now what systems are most important to deliver the capability we need. And I'm guardedly optimistic we're getting there, but that's a hard problem doing a really good risk-based operational analysis is hard work. Thank you. Yep. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Um, I'm an old surface warfare officer, so going back to your original question about Guam and the destroyer, yep. I'd much rather be on the destroyer than Andrews Air or Anderson Air Force Base. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, but the golf course is better at Anderson. Right. Um, you know, with the, your comments about cost and capability, and there's, I think there's another part of the triad, which is schedule, mm -hmm. uh, and it really gets to a culture within the acquisition community. And I'm, I'm the guy that mentioned the, the, the com made the comment about program managers, and I think program managers were brought up in a culture of it's all about cost and it's all about schedule. Right. And the first thing that goes away is capability. We witnessed this. I, I've witnessed it over the last 30 years in the Navy. What are we doing to change the culture inside the acquisition community? Um, so I, I think the changing of the culture is coming about with some of the, the statute that Congress put in place, letting us do more prototyping, 
letting us do more, uh, letting us use other transactional authorities. There's a very important piece of legislation, uh, Section 804, I think it was a couple years ago, that's called the middle tier of acquisition, where you can do away with a lot of the bureaucratic things that most program managers have to do if you can field a capability within five years. Those types of things will go about changing the culture, I think, because all of a sudden, um, speed and agility are becoming as important as cost and schedule. Uh, and it's an experiment. I mean, I can't look you in the eye with 100% certainty and say it will work, um, but going to more prototyping, going to more rapid spins on acquisition should change the culture. And if it doesn't, we're going to have a real big problem because we now have an urgent, urgent challenge that we have to face. Help me change the culture. Change it in your corner of the world. Sorry, I don't have a better answer. Um, sir, thank you for your presentation. Um, my name is Jonathan Albaum, and I work at a company called Veritas Technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, we focus on data, and I really appreciated your comments about being able to take data and lots of data sets, turn the, that data into knowledge to drive decisions. What I find um, as I work with uh, different programs and, and, and different individuals, that nobody uh, in, in organizations, people don't often understand what data they have, mm -hmm. how many copies of data they have, what is the right data. Mm -hmm. And underlying all of that is, uh, is a need for some sort of a comprehensive data management strategy. Yep. Some, some approach. Um, can you speak for a few moments about uh, you know, activities related to establishing that strong foundation yep. to do what you were describing and what our, our rivals are doing? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so there's a couple of answers to that. First, within our office, we actually have stood up an office to think about data management and data management strategy. What data do we need? How are we going to use it? Um, second, <clears throat> I'm, I'm optimistic because there's, and this will show I'm a dinosaur, but there's this new field of study in many universities called uh, data science manager, data science, uh, uh, data sciences. We've hired a couple of those, those young, uh, young people, and they're really helping us think about how do we, how do we look at data? Uh, you know, I mean, we have to worry about the storage architecture, the retrieval architecture, all of that. But at the end of the day, it has to start with what data do we need and what are we going to do with it? Mm -hmm. We shouldn't collect stuff we're not going to use. So we need to think about more up front uh, the data we're, we're going after. And that's the purpose of this data management office. Um, and I'm sure we're not going to get it 100% right. Mm -hmm. But I absolutely agree with you that um, as we're going to a digitized world, Data is supreme, and we've got to really think about it yeah. hard. I would also offer that all the copies of data that get traded around mm -hmm. the DOD creates um, you know, opportunity to streamline that process and have fewer copies. Yes. It's hard to get at what the current data is when there's lots of things that look similar. So thank you for no, your absolutely. comments. Absolutely. So I guess the only thing I'd say is we're not there yet, but the fact that we have some people working on it gives us a better chance than if we had nobody working on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you. One more question. Good morning, Mr. Secretary. Steve Alonzo, Marine Electric Systems. We don't have just two suppliers or one supplier. In many areas, we have no suppliers. Correct. I sit on weekly calls where different commands, different organizations talk about it, ask my company how I can reverse engineer one, two, three, in one vendor's case, 700 different products you can no longer get. Yep. There's no money, and none of these commands believe they have the authority. Where does that authority lie, either in OSD or in the Navy? Um, so, my, my Office of Industrial Policy has the responsibility to pull it all together, but at the end of the day, I, I think the authority starts with the service, uh, service secretaries and the Secretary of Defense, and it trickles down as far as they have the courage to let it trickle down. 
and I can't speak in your particular case who has the authority. But it starts with identification. You notice one of the priorities is implementation of the Executive Order 13806. Implementation talks about what specific steps are we going to do to make sure we have access to certain pieces of equipment. And, you know, in some cases, the industrial sector may be too far gone, and the answer might be we have to come up with a new, uh, a whole new set of uh, systems, capabilities, but at least we have someone looking at it. And uh, the services are all involved at the SAE level with trying to think about what do we really need to protect first and foremost. Uh, and then at the end of the day, it's going to take a full court press by our office, by the services, and likely by some of you all going to work with Congress to explain why keeping this particular industrial partner alive is important. Thank you, sir. You bet. I think that's it. Um, folks, thank you. I hope it was helpful. Uh, go out and find the people to smoke the stogie with and drink the bourbon and talk about what you're doing because I need you to go fast and I need you to help us deliver to the kids that are going to use it. So thank you. Secretary Schaefer, thank you. It uh, strikes me that uh, your portfolio is extremely important to the success and to the theme and the mission of our conference. And uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to come out. We've got a Naval Institute press book, Learning <laughs> War by Trent Hone. It's got an FC, a bookmark inside. It's a small token of our appreciation. And we thank you. Terrific. Let's give another Thank hand. you, Admiral. Thank you.